The following podcast may contain swear words. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is the inner critic. So before we get to the the actual topic of today's podcast, though, uh, we kind of want to talk about what we're currently working on. So um, Holly, what are you working on right now? Okay, uh, at the moment, I'm working on lesson six of how to write short stories. This, uh, the, the course was running really long, and I got to tell you, this lesson is running really, really, really long, but um, <laughs> this is an important one. This is um, how to write to a theme, how to write for anthologies, how to make your own anthologies if you're wanting to do it to promote your work independently, um, and it's, it's turning into a really fun lesson. Um, and in fiction, okay, uh, last week, Viper's Nest, which is number five in the Longview series, next to last one, um, <laughs> went live. And uh, I also got some new editions of some of my old stuff out. Uh, Fire in the Mist, Mind of the Magic, Bones of the Past, all three got a brand new edition with a lot of cleanup and bug fixes and new... Um, new covers. Afterwards, new covers and new afterwards and... Yeah, so in new SB, ISBNs, <laughs> the whole the whole thing, because I, I I changed enough that I actually had to do that. Um, okay, so what about you? Well, v- Viper's Nest that's that's the the Katie Cadence Drake right. That's world, Cadence right? Drake settled space. That is um, when it's done. The entire six um, story series is essentially. Um, volume three of the Cadence Drake Settled Space thing, but it's told from the point of view of everybody who isn't Katie. <laughs> so it's it's like everything that's going on in Settled, settled Space after War Paint and before um, the Wishbone Conspiracy. Oh, nice. Okay, so that that was one thing that I didn't know, that it's that it's like in between her different stuff. Like it's, it's a world going on behind the scenes of her world. But but she's in this episode. She's in Viper's Nest, and Ooh. she is going to be the starting scene um, in the next one, which I don't have titled yet, but which I'm kind of tentatively thinking about calling The Owner's Tale. <sighs> I love The Owner. I've, I've been following that series. I, I'm enjoying it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are you working on? Oh, yeah. Um, I am currently working on... So I had a book uh, that I finished uh, on the 7th, 6th of July. I sent it off to you and Matt um, for the content edits. And I've got it back, and I, I, I have it in the hands of a beta reader who is a romance nut. Uh, that's actually part of the things that we bonded over when we were younger. Um, so she is a romance nut. She's going through it, and she I, I have asked her uh, a question or two, and she told me to shuddy. So (laughs) I am staying out of her way until she is finished with the book. What I'm working on right now, though, is I'm actually taking your short story course. Because even though I have written a whole bunch of short stories and even indie published them and and they've sold and the customers have been happy with with what they paid for. You know, I gave them more value than um, it was uh, than they paid, which is something I learned from you. Um, But this is something that I wanted to. Um, mentioned too is that I I never feel like I'm ever going to be um, at the point where I don't need to learn anymore so I felt like I wanted to knew to know different ways of of going through and and um, different ways of thinking I guess through stories through plotting through all this different stuff so I'm taking your courses and I'm on lesson three now Um, I'm not spending that much time on them so I, I did a lesson a day up until yesterday so I'm on lesson three and uh, these stories are part of the same world as the romance novel so the romance novel is in a place set a setting called Wanda Lucia and I want to take some of the little characters that are kind of mentioned in there and bring them into their own stories so I'm I am really loving the way that the how to write short stories is working because um, already, like I found some stuff making the list that you tell people to make in there. I am like just overjoyed at how different and weird, uh, my, my stories are going to be <laughs> because <laughs> y- 
my subconscious, my muse is incredibly happy with this, uh, with where I am, with um, the, the neat little things that you find inside your brain and then you find ways to put them in the stories. Oh, and, God, I love yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. And it's amazing because your your muse, like it, it picks up different things like for I've got three stories, three different characters, three completely different women. To, to write stories on and it picked out specific things for those women that would fit them best so <laughs> the way your brain works is just incredible yeah it really is well which kind of <laughs> takes us back to our topic of the day oh yes yeah <laughs> perfect segue or segment or yeah i don't know how to say that i don't remember <laughs> what it is but yeah, you did it perfectly um yeah so our topic today is the inner critic um, so why don't you define the inner critic for us? Oh, okay. Um, the inner critic gets a bad rap and sometimes deservedly so. Your, your brain has two separate creative elements. It has your muse, which is your right brain. It has your inner critic, which is your left brain. And these two parts of you connect through what's called the corpus callosum. They talk to each other a little bit, but not very well. Um, and you, you have, when you learn how to tap into it, this amazing ability to just pull ideas out of seemingly nowhere and turn them into fiction. And then you have this ability that you are very well aware of to bring in your inner critic, your you, and have that part of yourself look at what you have written and say, okay, this is good, this is bad. The problem people have with their inner critics is that the vast majority of them have not learned how to switch between right brain tasks and left brain tasks. So their inner critic is also trying to create fiction. And this is a recipe for just disaster. <laughs> this is, oh God, this is the worst thing you can do to your creativity is turn your left brain loose in that initial phase where you are coming to grips with the story ideas and the concepts and your right brain needs to be treated with this delicacy and this tenderness that your re your your left brain just does not have your your left brain is kind of a dick and <laughs> um and this is true for all of us in that that we have this part of us that protects us and that keeps us safe and that um, make sure that we do not make fools of ourselves in public and that's the left brain and the right brain is this six-year-old kid who is exuberant and full of life and not afraid to try anything and will jump off the side of a barn holding an umbrella to try to fly and for those of us who used to spend a lot of our time trying to fly um, your right brain can really get you hurt if you're not careful um, but but these two elements um, can be connected they can, you can learn how to work back and forth between the two of them and when you do that you stop having a problem with your inner critic so so you're saying it's it's kind of like a skill that you can learn to master it is absolutely a skill that you can learn to master it takes a little bit of time it takes some thinking exercises it's one of the things that i cover in a number of classes um it's one of the things i actually include in the free flash fiction class um, is it, I, I always sneak up on this in the exercises and the worksheets and stuff that I give. I never say, okay, well, this is where you're going to be using your left brain. Now this is where you're going to be using your right <laughs> brain because that tips them off and you want to keep them mixed up. So I just put together worksheets in which I ask questions and the different parts of your brain will answer them differently. And as you start shifting back and forth and doing these tasks, um, you start bringing your your two brains together and having them work together without them getting in each other's way but you know that's not it's it took me a while it took me a while oh, oh boy when I first started oh well, first off when I first started I really sucked <laughs> my fiction <laughs> yeah we'll was have just... to we'll have to have a podcast episode on on just uh how you started and why and everything yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I did not discover the role of my left brain until seven years in at the point where I learned how to do a revision for the first time 
And I had been struggling back and forth and writing stories and killing editors. Um, you know, I would get these, these things saying, oh, dear God, no more. <laughs> <laughs> from oh actually there were real letters back then but uh, you would get these 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 editorial requests to never send them anything else because oh you were God. so horrible now talk about talk about some some stick with it attitude is, is that you got these these horribly depressing letters from editors and you just kept going <laughs> oh i did i saved the damn things i put them in a big ass shoe box and i saved them all by the time I actually sold my first thing, which was two sonnets, believe it or not, to a science fiction magazine. One, a dirty sonnet about an android ro uh, a robot, a sex bot. Um, and the other one uh, about a hard drive crash. And they were both done in beautiful Shakespearean, perfectly rhythmed, perfectly set out sonnet format. And those were my first two sales. And those those were created almost with with no help from my inner critic, because I had by that time discovered how to keep that bastard in check. <laughs> so, so okay, so it's more like um, uh, w would you define it as more like a, a skill that you learn and and can continue like riding a bike? Like you might get a little rusty, but you you can hop back on and it doesn't take long. Or would you describe it like? exercising and building muscles and if you quit for a long time then you're going to have to redo everything over again no this is bicycle this is pure bicycle okay. if once awesome. once you and your once your right brain and your left brain can start talking together uh then your right brain never shuts up so that's a different episode too <laughs> okay well so we've got um how, how does your inner critic why why does it do what it does you, you said that it's about protecting you mm-hmm Right. It is, it sees danger. It tells you to stay safe. It tells you to um, be kind of invisible. It tells you to be careful. Your right brain is going climb that tree, leap off of that swing set, go down the sliding board, standing on your feet. This, this, by the way, was my very first incident of getting in trouble with my kindergarten teacher, wherein... <laughs> I decided I was going to do the equivalent of snowboarding down the sliding board, standing oh, no. up on my shoes. And I did it, and it was awesome. It was so cool. And she grabbed me and took me in, and I had to talk to the principal. <laughs> <laughs> because apparently they didn't want us trying to kill ourselves at school. And she was pretty sure that's what I was doing. Well, plus the fact that you were doing that and then other kids are going to say, oh, my God, that's so cool. And they might not be as well coordinated as you were. And, you know, then, you know, injuries. <laughs> yes, that too. I was a bad influence. <laughs> so basically, when you are looking at your writing, the right brain is saying, I want to I'm going to do all of these fanciful things with my words. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then your left brain is saying, well, you can't write for shit. This is not done well. This is, you know, you're using too many commas, not enough commas. You, like, what is that word even doing in there? That sort of thing. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's ex exactly it. But not only that, your right brain is the one who wants to write. Your right brain is this creative drive that you have inside you that is just desperate to be fed and and sitting in a room with invisible people is how you feed this but your left brain is going no that's crazy talk no <laughs> no that's we need a safe job we need a secure job we need to know that there's a retirement plan and uh, whatever those thingies are called where you save up money you can tell who doesn't have one. Um, <laughs> 401k. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm still, I am still on that sliding board and sliding, standing up down the sliding board now. So how, how in general, like how do you shut it up when you need to shut it up? First, you have to acknowledge that it's there. You have to give it the respect that it deserves. Because the thing that your inner critic is going to do is when you have written your first draft and you have it done, your inner critic is going to be able to go through if you respect it, if you treat it with kindness, if you're not calling it names in the back of your mind, and it is going to be able to pull out for you the areas where you missed what you were trying to do. Um, it is going to be able, well, you've just gone through this process 
why don't you why don't you explain a little bit about going through your first real serious revision oh man that <laughs> that is it was insane then uh, I told you this before, but it's it's like the taking your how to revise your novel course is like the best tor. It's like the best and the worst torture that you can ever spend money on. <laughs> that, <laughs> that needs to be the slogan for that for that that course. Best um, torture writing, ever. Yeah, yeah. I I have I have um. T- I, okay, so I've written before, I've I've edited before, I've done, you know, stuff in the past, and I, I've got, you know, a bunch of three-day novels that I've written, I've, I've got a whole bunch of nano, NaNoWriMo novels, I've got regular novels that I've written, I've, I've done a whole lot of writing. This is the first time that I have ever fully revised something from, from a finished first draft to the end, and I mean, I thought I had trouble with an inner critic when I was writing the book, you know, and I, I mean, I thought that was bad, you know, cause it would tell you, oh, this, this scene sucks. Oh, there's no chemistry here. Oh, this, this character is whiny and stupid and repeats itself. And that's just writing. When you go into revising and you go over your book 10 million times and, and you go through these courses, we're going to have to do a, an entire episode on how to revise your novel on, on that lesson be, or on that course, because it's an incredible course. Um, it, especially for the fact that If you're taking it for the first time, you are basically, you think you're, you're lost in this fog where you can only see maybe like a foot or two ahead of you. And you you think that you're curving, you think that you're going up and down mountains, you think that you're going in tunnels and, and making lefts and rights and walking around in circles. But by the time you finish it, you're basically, you have this overhead bird's eye view and you see it was a straight path all along. So it's, it's fascinating but your inner critic the entire time is telling you this is awful this is stupid you should quit just stop and start the entire book over again and this is the second time I've tried to go through the how to revise your novel because the first time was with glass house which I you know is is shelved um for a little while Mm -hmm. and I still remember thinking all of this how horrible you know your your writing is you're never and having an author for a mom has been both beneficial and also a little bit detrimental because when you grow up reading all of your mom's books when you have have you know some of your favorite novels are your mom's books like Talon is is one of my favorite books ever written and I I love these books so much that when you start writing yourself there's that extra pressure like I'm never going to be my mom I'm never going to be as good as that I'm not going to have the same kind of stories because it's funny for somebody who loves horror films and and action and suspense and stuff like that my favorite thing to write is romance and I can't stand most romance movies because of the the women so it's like I, I also have that going against me because a lot of people don't like romance so all of this stuff is in my inner critic brain And having to tell yourself, just keep going, just keep pushing forward, just, it's, it's, it is like this dance, this dance with, with landmines. (laughs) That, (laughs) that's what it feels like working with the inner critic. Um, and I, I cannot believe it, it is the hardest thing that I have ever had to do in my life. Um, you know, I, I went to college for a short while thinking that I needed, you know, to do that. I have, I've worked out extensively to lose a whole lot of weight before I've done so many things that were difficult. Nothing has been as difficult, you know, not including tragedies, personal tragedies, but nothing has been as difficult as the how to revise your novel uh, course. And nothing has been as fulfilling as finishing it as, as having gone through every single lesson and doing every single thing there was that that I could and really learning to work with the inner critic but I'm definitely not a pro at it and I love that we're broaching this topic because I know there's more things that I can learn and I it it's just it can be overwhelming it can cause you to procrastinate it can cause you to when you go up to your book and you sit down in front of it again you just you're so you feel like, oh, this wretched freaking thing again, you know, even though there's so much good in there. So that's why I was, I was wondering, you know, how do you, how do you get it to shut up? How do you get it to, um, when do you know 
when you need to shut it up and when you need to listen. If you're in first draft, <clears throat> you need to have it shut up. That's that's just you you have to develop this working relationship with the two halves of yourself, with your creative self and with your critical self. And while you are doing first draft, you have to acknowledge that the inner critic is there because it will show up from time to time and it will comment on your work. And you have to say, look, you know, you have to say, look, you know, I am in the middle of first draft right now. I know this is not perfect. And you have to give yourself permission to suck. And that is the hardest thing to do. You have to say, yes, I acknowledge that right this minute I am writing first draft and all first draft is shit. That's the rule. It is. It is. No matter. And you will have some amazing stuff come out of the middle of your first draft when you cut loose, when you let go of your determination to get it perfect on page the first time. You just tell yourself, all first draft is shit. If you are not a fan of, of, of the Wicked Wango Tongue, you can say, um, is poo. Or is, I like um, poo. Is poop. Yes, <laughs> I like that word. Poop is a yeah. fun word. But but you people hurt themselves by demanding that their first drafts be perfect. So let me ask you a question about that too. What sure. about revising as you go? Oh God, oh God, don't do that because you will never get past the first part. Because no matter how long you revise until you have finished writing the story, you don't know the story you're writing. I have never written the ending that I anticipated on a book, not once, not once. Now, there have been a couple of times where I've come kind of close, sort of, but, but no, you, the, the whole time you are writing first draft, your right brain is collaborating with every piece of your life that you have ever lived to pull in weird stuff that you didn't know was back there. It has this treasure trove of everything you have been through in your entire life. And that's sh that stuff is just shoved in the back of your mind, sitting there waiting. And your right brain knows it's there. And it will pull stuff out and change the shape of it and change the feel of it and throw it into your story. And until you have gotten all the way to the end, you don't know the story you're telling. You know the story you think you're yeah. telling. And you know the story that is going to... Um, be what you don't write when you're done. Because it's it's like this first run through for your right brain where it is getting all of these different pieces out onto the page. And then you are bringing them to life in the revision. But until you get all of that stuff out there, your left brain doesn't know what your right brain has stored. There is, these are different areas of the brain. They don't talk well to each other. Um, they don't necessarily get along well. Uh, there, there's, there's really cool stuff on split brain experimentation that's been done. Um, but we're not going to get into that right now. Basically, so it sounds like revision is, from everything that we've discussed so far, it sounds like revising as you go along is your left brain, your inner critic, basically trying to take control. Mm -hmm. And it, it also sounds detrimental because if you are... If you're writing this stuff, you in, in your like you say in that and both in, in your revision course too, is that um, you don't know where this is going to go. So you could, A, potentially be revising shit that you're going to cut anyway. Yes. Or B, you could be stifling your muse, your right brain. You could be stifling it, trying to pigeonhole it into uh, this, this kind of um, stiff, awkward book story path. And you'll never know how good or how deep or how meaningful a lot of what you've written could be because mm -hmm. you're, you're basically letting your left brain boss your right brain around. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And I know that when you went back through and when I read your book, I could see all of this stuff that you had put in there that you had pulled from your own life. And I know you didn't put that in there on purpose. No, a lot of it I didn't like. There's um, there's a scene where she is uh, where the main character is massaging the love interest um, back, and this is just one small 
even, you know, mention. And she's talking about how, you know, he's like, how did you learn how to do this? And she says, oh, my mom used to have, you know, neck tightness or something like that and, and massaging it. And when I wrote that scene, I had no idea that, that I did not remember the fact that you used to have neck and shoulder problems and mm-hmm. I would massage your back for you. I didn't yeah. remember that until I was going through the revision and I was like, holy crap, look at that. And that's just one tiny little piece. Yeah, that's and your brain is throwing that stuff out if you will let it. If you will give yourself permission in your first draft to write shit, then you will write the best writing you have ever done because your right brain doesn't write shit. Your right brain is the part of you that comes up with all of this amazing stuff that it has put together and learned from, from everything you have ever lived through. Your left brain is entirely capable of writing shit, but, but your inner critic is very good for spotting shit and, and fixing it. Okay. So for the first draft, we, we, we try to keep the left brain out when it shows up when it shows up on the page and you realize it and you say oh god i need to go back and change that don't you just say okay no i'm going to leave it just as it is on the page um inner critic left brain um editor thank you you know your turn is next and you just you you know you, you can acknowledge this as formally or as informally as you want but you acknowledge it you say okay this is a later part of the process I'm doing now. It's not time for that process yet. You'll get your turn. That That is literally what you just said. The last part of it, you'll get your turn, mm-hmm. is what I had to tell myself every single day, several times while I was writing. Because I did get through about 50,000 words in 19 days. I wrote the entire first draft in 19 days. And that is what I had to tell my inner critic all the time because it would it it would tell me that this is crap and my thing is I went to school um film school when I was 23 or 24 and I had originally always wanted to be a film writer or film director and stuff when I was younger so my thing is I would either tell it um you'll get your turn or I'll fix it in post (laughs) that's like literally that's the one thing that you that is it it's funny because it's the opposite in film like you never want to say I'll fix it in post but with writing I'll fix it in post. <laughs> yes, yes. That is how you get your best work is you you stay out of your own way. And that that is a very hard skill to learn. But, but, but you can do it. Oh, God, it's totally learnable. And the more you learn to do it, the more you start connecting with this other part of your brain that has been silenced for so long. And most people just completely crush their right brains, man. They just, they, they don't take anything from them. They don't do anything the right brain wants to do. And that's this poor little trapped six-year-old stuck inside your head who wants to play and do amazing things and chase butterflies and have fun. And the vast majority of people never let but it. But you can bring it back out. It's, it's yes. never a permanent oh, it doesn't die. death for the right brain. <laughs> no, no. Okay. No, it does not die. This is anybody, anybody can do this. You can do this if you want to. It just takes a little work. So... Here's another another question, something that um, and I had I had seen this on uh, the questions in your Patreon page as well, is basically what do you tell the basically it's it's that feeling of the inner critic telling you to quit, telling you just you're not good enough Um, when it becomes overwhelming. Like, how do you get over that? How do you get past the inner critic telling you to quit? That was, this has been a number of years ago for me. This doesn't happen anymore for me. So this, this is something that as you write enough does go away. But initially it was a big deal. Oh God, initially (laughs) I wrote, um, my first novel and this, this novel was never published. This was, it was hearts and stitches. It was a romance between a nurse and an architect and it was bad. It was very, very bad, but I wrote it. I did the whole thing. I finished it up over on vacation where I was writing 12 pages a day just to get the thing done. Uh, I sent it off. It, I, and I went through, um, you know, and I did what I thought was revision, which is you go in, you find words, you put better words in, and you send it off. And that is not revision. That is not <laughs> revision. That is nothing like revision. It took me seven years after that book to learn how to do revision. But I did that. And 
I got a single page, uh, a typed, single spaced, full page letter from an editor telling me what I had done wrong and rejecting the novel. I was a total noob living out in the sticks and I knew nothing about what it meant to get a single spaced, typed, full page edit revision type letter from an editor if i had versus taken, the form letter <laughs> versus the form letter which everybody got and everybody gets i didn't know how close i was and uh you know i don't know how i got that close because i sure didn't get that close again for another seven years but um after that i was crushed i was crushed and i cried and everything I wrote, I started writing. I decided I was going to write short stories. And I wrote them and I sent them out and they'd come back. And the editors were kind of supporting my theory that I really sucked because I would get things like, no, no more. And um, <laughs> yes, please, yes, thank you for your time. No, just a little checkbox in the thing there. This, we are not accepting uh, any further submissions at this time, you know, which is, I think, please go. <laughs> jump in a hole and die um <laughs> it was it was miserable and i had more than a hundred of those things in the shoebox by the time i finally sold something which was those two sonnets but it was it was just i need to do this and i had leverage on myself not because i wanted so much to be a writer I, I told myself, it doesn't matter how much I suck. It doesn't matter how bad I am at this. I have to do it anyway, because the only way I'm ever going to be able to stay home with my kids is if I do that. So, you know, I can't tell you what your leverage needs to be. Okay. But you have to know why you want to write. So you, this is about motivating yourself. Yeah. This is, this is how basically getting over the inner critic is about getting leverage on your on yourself and and your dreams and pushing past the the awkward stages and the horrible writing it and just yeah oh and the fear yeah and the fear the, it is enormously scary to send your work to somebody who reads that for a living that is an absolutely terrifying step to take and to understand that 99.99 something percent of everything that goes out, everything from everyone, comes back with a rejection slip, and most of those rejection slips are form, that's terrifying. It is so hard to do. And to get past that, and to get past it more than 100 times before yeah. anybody says yes, you have to know why you want to do this, and you really have to want to do it okay so yeah I guess that's that's one of the best kind of answers is it's it's also scary because yeah. you have to to motivate yourself you have to to like you said get leverage yeah. on yourself know why you want this um so with with that as well you're looking at like you said d dozens to hundreds of form letter rejections mm -hmm. so you're not going to know where you're going wrong either um right i know at a time you had a writer's group which helped. that's yeah and now this is going to sound like a plug it's not a plug um you have free forums yeah for people yeah anybody can join anybody can join now anybody who is a who is a, a serious writer if you really want to do this if you if you just want to talk about writing you are not going to enjoy the forums but if you are actually sitting there with button chair getting pages done, then these are your people and they are nice, good people and they get kicked out if they're not. So, <laughs> yeah. so we have the very, very strict terms of service in, in, in what you can and cannot say to other people because, you know, and how you critique and stuff yeah, like and that too. Crit, yeah. And just that, that you have to be kind. And basically if you're willing to be kind and if you're willing to be helpful, these are your people. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you're looking to lord your skills over somebody else, you are not going to like us. <laughs> no, no. I, I remember uh, one of the nanorimos around here it, when we first um, 
moved here basically I wanted to do NaNoWriMo I wanted to meet some other writers and stuff and I remember down in South Florida it was the same thing I tried to find writers in my areas and there are so many writers especially in South Florida and you get together for these these writers groups where you're sitting in a in a coffee house with your laptops and you're writing and I was so eager and so happy but you would have maybe a couple of people that were interested in writing and the rest of them just wanted to talk wanted to oh you know hey if you need some help in your writing I'm really good at at revisions I'm really good at you know I'm I, I'm I'm really good at critiquing I'm really good at seeing where other people go wrong you want to stay away from people like that um Yes. And one of the best things that I have, ever, I'm not a forum person at all. I'm, I'm not crazy about forums. I'm not crazy about um, putting up a whole bunch of um, my stuff or reading other people's stuff. When it, when it comes to the forums at Holly's writing classes, um, they're amazing. You, you go through, you, you see other people. Um, and, and again, I'm using how to revise your novel as, as my you know, knowledge, but they, people post their questions. They, if they don't understand something about a lesson, then they'll post their questions. They'll be like, okay, I don't get this. And everybody floods into help. Well, this is how I saw this lesson, or this is how I took this. And, and I posted a question and I had three or four people come in and say, yes, oh my God, I had the same problem. Um, please somebody help. And people would help. So, and I've, I've noticed that it's the same way with the open discussion. Um, and you can ask you questions too, or people can ask you questions too. Mm -hmm. They just go in there and they, they write for Holly and then they, you know, as soon as you see it pretty much and you, you do forums every day and you go in and you check on things. So I cannot express how amazing it is when you are getting rejection letters and you don't know what is wrong and you've been submitting and submitting and, and nobody wants your work. It, it can feel like you don't know where to turn. You don't know what's wrong with form letters. They don't tell you there's too much exposition or there's, you know, like I, there's not enough character. I have no idea who these people are. It's, it's so flat. When you take your work to a forum where it's protected and you can, you can look for, you, you can even post like, I'm looking for some people to help me figure out what's wrong with my writing. People will volunteer and you can put your stuff up there. And then you've got this, this whole world of people who are incredible and they want to help. Yeah. And, and it's just this sort of, they help you, you help them. It, it's, yeah. Yeah. It, and it works. It works. And that's, that's how I found out that um, I I wanted to take, um, I think it was your motivation course. No, 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 not the motivation. What's the other one? The uh, writer's block course. Because I was, I was uh, talking to somebody in open discussion, and I, I don't remember what it was exactly, but I, I, I was basically just saying, because I don't personally believe in in writer's block I know other people do I don't judge people that do um but I know that it's it's all mental thing it's all you with your brain so I don't believe that writer's unless block you're on is antidepressants like... yes yeah well <laughs> stimulants I can that's a completely different yeah. idea that's definitely a topic we'll have to cover but um I think when it's just you sometimes your life gets in the way sometimes your brain gets in the way those those are how we define writer's block a mm -hmm. lot of the time and somebody told me in there, um, it might have been you and it might have been Kat or somebody else that just said, you, you should take the writer's block course just to kind of see. And it it never would have dawned on me, even though it should have, because I wasn't facing exactly that situation. But just that one suggestion in, in a free forum just completely fixed so much. And I've, I've found with the writer's block that... It's it's lessons that have stuck in my head and that I use all of the time. Cool. Yeah. So um let's let me take a look at some of the questions that we had on your Patreon page because I know you posted for people to kind of ask something. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, this is an interesting one. Uh basically she's talking about her her inner critic is telling her that she's written herself into a hole that she'll never get out of. So it's it's basically that idea of um, your brain creating a problem that you think you can't solve. So mm -hmm. how would you go about that? Okay. Um, first off, there is no hole that you can dig that you cannot dig stairs back out of. Um, sometimes all you have to do is drop back to the last point where uh, where your book was working. 
and you cut out a section or you set it aside, you put it in its own little file and you move around it. Um, but generally, if possible, you want to leave all your words in first draft in place as they are unchanged. So then you can either, uh, you ask yourself a question and I am huge on asking yourself questions. It is how I have figured out everything that has ever gone wrong in my stories, how I have figured out how to get out of it. Okay. So you are sitting there and you have dug yourself into a hole. So you say, okay, now I'm in a hole. How do I get out? Well, I make the hole deeper. How can I make this even worse for my character while a bringing in a new, another new character or B, um, bringing back something that I wrote earlier and adding that as a complication or C, um, changing the changing what I think is happening in here and saying, okay, how is this not what it looks like? Um, how am I not really in this hole? It looks like a hole and it looks like I'm trapped, but what am I missing? And then you start answering that question. And when you answer that question, a couple of really good things happen. First of all, your story gets twistier. It gets more complex. It gets deeper. It starts adding tension and conflict. And the next thing that happens is you figure out a way to dig yourself out of the hole. It is one of the most empowering things when you are asking your, your subconscious these questions that you're saying. It, when you are asking yourself, okay, how do I get out of this? How do I fix this? And you ask the right questions and you get the answers. It is one of the most amazing things when your brain comes up to, with, the, with the answer to solve that problem you created. Yeah. The question for how do I fix this is rarely how do I fix this. Yeah, it's usually <laughs> no. How yeah, can in, in I fact, make that's this... more of a left left brain question that's right. just going to block that right brain. Right, right. The right brain question is, how can I make this so much worse? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Evil laugh. So it's all about asking questions, and you have to. Sometimes it can take a while. You have to ask a decent amount of questions. Right, right. It, 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 you can you can run up a lot of words trying to answer a question and getting the wrong way. I have. I have an inner critic story about that, as a matter of fact, um, which is the, the worst thing my inner critic ever did to me, and it did it twice while I was on deadline, and it caused me, on deadline, to throw away 60,000 words twice. <laughs> oh twice. my God. On a novel that ran, I think, 100 to 110,000 words. So oh. I threw away 120,000 words of a 110,000 word novel. It left you in a deficit. <laughs> yeah, it did, did. Well, yes, yes. I, there was a bunch of stuff, but I, I mean, I was, and I was just hauling ass on the deadline, and it was tight. This was for the book that was to be titled "Closer Than Chaos," uh, closer to chaos, and uh, it turned out being God's old and dark. Uh, no, it didn't. It was the one before that. And it was the other way around. Yeah. Right. No, it was closer originally... to chaos. No, closer to chaos was a title I. I, I swore I would never use chaos in the title again. The Wreck of Heaven. <laughs> yes. Wreck of Heaven, that's right. That's yes, right. the Wreck of Heaven. And um, it, it, because it was saying, well, first of all, I did let my muse run a little amok. And this redheaded chick showed up sitting on a bench next to one of my heroes. And they were feeding the ducks. And all of a sudden, she turns to him and asks him this question. Or, or says to him, um, just be careful, and leaves a package on the bench and walks away. And my skin, my, I mean, the hair on my arms rose and my skin just goose bumped. And I <laughs> stared at this and I went, oh my God, this is the coolest thing. She's a secret agent for someone. Now, this in a book that had no secret agents, that was... Um, kind of an, it was an urban fantasy with a carefully built world that was very, very specifically set in a small town. And all of a sudden I'm bringing in a woman who turns into the FBI and then she turns into this horrible, horrible slut. And then she <laughs> turns into just, and she just totally derailed the book. And I probably could have figured out a way to save it. But at that point I had not yet really integrated the asking, asking questions thing. So I went back to the first place she showed up and I threw out 60,000 words. 
Oh my goodness. Started back in. Said, okay, I've got this this time. And I'm writing along and the story's going pretty well. And these two and the my heroine, my, my main, my protagonist, dead parents showed up in her house as ghosts at the dinner table. And I went, wow, that's cool. How did that happen? No, no, wrong answer. But my, I, my muse was so desperate for words right then that I just ran with it. And I got 60,000 oh. words of a story that included ghosts in this very carefully developed world that did not include ghosts in this. And, and my inner critic said, and I didn't, again, had not yet integrated the questions. Didn't know that you can fix this if you just ask a better question. <laughs> so I took out another 60,000 words and started over for the third time. And, and this time had a, a tighter index card outline, which um, that might have been the point at which I invented the index card outline. I'm not sure. But um, I made it through that third time. And I hit the deadline in spite of everything, in spite of throwing away more book than I kept. But, oh, holy crap. So your inner critic, if, you, if your inner critic is turned loose and you don't know how to um, prevent it from, from the slash and burn method, your inner critic can do some very, very bad things to your scheduling and your sanity. <laughs> Not very many people would have been able to make that deadline. You, you see... Um movies all the time with writers that are having writer's block or something like that and they're not mm -hmm. they're missing their deadlines over and over and over again like a stranger than fiction a fantastic film and she's just so over her deadline um so yeah i, I can see how um it, the, the thing was uh she didn't have kids to feed she didn't have the worry of going homeless you know right. and your thing was um you know if if i don't get this by deadline uh we're not we gonna don't get paid eat. we're not gonna eat yeah, yeah. and we might be on the street yeah. <laughs> so that, that's yeah. a big motivator um <laughs> so did you have any funny any any kind of funny story before we wrap this up about what your oh. um muse might or your not your muse but your inner critic might have done to you yes yes um actually with my very first novel fire in the mist oh good okay we can wrap it up on a lighter note then <laughs> yes oh god yes because this one is pretty good um i was i had gotten my whole first draft done and was reading through it and by this time I had figured out to some extent what became my final product my my final process for revision and my right brain looked at the flying horses and said that's too easy and <laughs> I went no no that's they had to build the flying horses in the you know the, the this is what you mean your left your left brain looked yeah, at, looked at the flying horses? Yeah, my left brain said, that's too okay. easy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> left brain critic said, no, no, the, the horses, that's very nice. We like the flying horses. It's too easy. All right. Um, how could I make it harder? A and then I started running through the logical part of my brain. Well, how do horses work? Horses, you know, they, they need a lot of oxygen. They run, uh, they have a very specific kind of gait, a canter, a gallop, uh, a trot, and these their legs have to move in specific ways in order to keep them moving forward. Um, it's very tricky to stay on a horse. I used to have a horse. I uh, had two, actually. And it's very, very tricky to stay on the back of a horse when it's shifting gates. If you're not prepared for it, if you're riding bareback, if you just, you know, bad things can happen and you can land on your butt, and I did it a bunch of times. One of my very best scars. Anyway, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen people ride side saddle and that just scares the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay, so these are flying horses, but they're still horses. So how do they land? They don't have a gate for landing. There is no flying horse landing gate. Oh, this <laughs> is going to be fun. And I have them land and landing on a flying horse is a nightmare. It's a horrible, horrible experience in which you're not sure if the horse is going to catch his feet or not because this is not how he's designed to work and then there was the scene with the cat and there was a cat in there his name was Flynn and he was looking at a candle and all of a sudden I realized oh my god what if he had hands <laughs> and so 
Every because, cat owner's nightmare on the yes, planet. <laughs> yes. What if the little bugger had hands? Because my right brain was saying, again, cat, you're not using him. You're not using him for anything. He's just sitting there. Why is he in the book? If he's not doing something, he can't be in the book. You so mean I your gave, left brain? Left that, brain that was left saying brain. That. This was left brain. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This was this is this was my inner critic going, no, no. You do not have characters in a book if they're not there for a reason. What's his reason? Well, he was the boat mage's experiment. And she got tired of opening the door for him to let him out so he wouldn't poop on the floor. <laughs> so being very clever but not too bright, she gave him hands. And um, it turns out he loved matches and learned how to use them. So he became a firebug cat. And then there were some... Yeah, he became one of the heroes of the book. And his progeny uh, ended up in a, a couple of later stories. When when you read that book, you, you get the idea... Because all cats have different personalities. But most cat owners have had or known of ones that are kind of, you know, sassy. Like Thea, she's, she's very sassy. You Then you get ones that are like Jeeves. Mm -hmm. And they are little criminal masterminds <laughs> they 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 love to sit there and kind of stalk on you they've got an attitude now they might also be loving but they are also slightly evil so <laughs> you you get one of those and i have the feeling that flynn is is very much like jeeves with hands and that thought just terrifies me <laughs> so Yes. That is that is definitely a case of, of left brain when you kind of need to listen to it, which I yes. think is also very brilliant. Yes, your, your left brain will find, will find places where your story is weak. And if you are at that proper point in your story, then you, you and you have, you, you said, okay, you know, left brain, it's your turn. Come on, get, come in and show me where I can be better. And your left brain will say, okay, well, you know, you have, a, you have a character in there that's not doing anything right now. And sure, it's just a cat. But, you know, if it's not doing anything, why is it in there? In your, your left brain will feed you the things that you need if you're willing to listen and if you're willing to do the massive amounts of work it takes to <laughs> fix, at least initially, it gets much easier. It does. I know, I know you just ground through that first revision. But oh my it, goodness. every single one you do after this will be easier than that one. I'm not saying they'll be yeah. easier. The easy. No, yeah. The, it, it looks like, especially when you do bigger, more complicated books, they're, they're not going to be easier, easier. Yeah. But it's the process will um, be more, you know, routine. Mm -hmm. and I know nothing about writing is routine, which is one of the best things about this, this kind of career that, you, that you're looking at. Yeah. But um, it... I, I do, that was one of the things that helped me get through as well, knowing that next time uh, I won't have this question of why am I doing this? Right. Um, I know that everything I do, there is a reason for it and it and it leads to a much, much better book. Right. Well, the one more thing I want to add on that though. Yeah, Is go ahead. that your, your next revision is going to be easier too because you learned 7 million things that you did this time that oh you made as mistakes that you won't do next time. Oh, yes. Oh, so yes. <laughs> just by process of attrition, you can weed a lot of, of problems yeah. out of your work that you will never have to deal with again. You'll make new ones and the new yeah, ones new will mistakes. drive you nuts. But, yeah, but a lot of those things, you're absolutely right. Because when you're going through the revision, you're like, why did I do this? And and I can also see w one, one good thing from having done Glass House first and having not finished that revision is when I started writing um, Leaving Wanda Lucia, when I started writing that book, I already had things in mind from an unfinished revision that I did that I was not going to make the same mistakes. And there are some little things that, that, that you're going to still put in there because when your right brain takes over and you're in the flow and you, you just, oh my God, some so much stuff. stuff. just happens. But I, for, for just example, all of these characters that you create and just start putting in and just start putting in and then you realize they have no purpose or you know that's a nice little story let's save him for a different story I only had one of those characters in this book and I had like 20 or 30 in Glass House <laughs> yes I it, it's just amazing how much of a difference 
a, a single revision can make on your mindset. So every time you revise, you'll just get better and better and better. And I love that. Um, so looking at everything that we've discussed, um, kind of give us a wrap up and then give us some actionable items that we can take uh, to, to maybe if we're working on something now and we're having inner critic problems. Okay. Um, just kind of as a wrap up, your inner critic is not your enemy. It's not the enemy of your writing. It's just that you need to give it a time and a place because you have to connect with your, your inner passionate crazy, wild, take risks, goofy, six-year-old inner self um, who will give you the most amazing fiction you can write. And then, and then you bring in the adult, the, the, the one of you who can see where problems are. And you, you have to learn how to train your inner critic to be kind. Um, and this is, this is essential training, and you can learn it. But to get there, it takes some time, it takes some effort, and it takes acknowledging that, okay, yes, you are my inner critic, and yes, there are probably problems with this, and yes, I, I know I am writing bad stuff. It's okay. I'm allowed to write bad stuff. That's what this part of the process is for. Okay, so my takeaway on that is just when your inner critic is involved, relax and breathe. Um, it has an important job. It'll be okay relax and breathe, let it go. You will have a chance to go back and fix things later. Next, acknowledge that when you're creating, um, you promise your inner critic that it will get its turn. It will. You are not going to send this stuff out raw, unfinished first draft. It gets to go through and help you look brilliant. And then third, you follow through. When you're done, you give the book the story, whatever it is you're writing, at least a week where you walk away, where you don't look at it, where you don't touch it, where it just slips away from your mind and you go do another story or something else. But after a week, you bring in your inner critic and you let your inner critic read it and you listen to what it says. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we can always cover the topic again if we get, you know, um, uh, like an overabundance of questions, any specifics or anything like that. But I, I do love that takeaway, especially the point where you're telling it, um, you'll get your shot. You, you will, I, you are a necessary part of this, this, mm -hmm. um, whole sequence of events and you will have complete control, um, at one point or another, you know, down the line. Uh, and, and that thing that I, I said earlier, if you fix it in post, <laughs> that's basically what you're saying. So yes. I, yeah, that has been our episode, our very first episode, and it was on the inner critic. If you have any questions at all, we have a myriad of places where you can kind of pop in and, and ask them. It would be really helpful if they just picked one so that oh, we can yeah. stay on. Well, I'm yeah, just saying so there's, there's Twitter there's, we've got our Twitter, uh, but, but let's go over that real quick. It, it's best if you went to our blog and found the episode, which is, again, it's going to be the very first episode. We're going to have the title inner critic. So it's very easy to find the blog. Um, you can f basically go to alone in a room with invisible people.com or alone with invisible people.com, uh, or even air whip, which is a I a R W I P.com. And uh, it's a very simple page. It's just going to pretty much be the blog. It's got some links on there, but find our first episode and go ahead and type in some questions. Let us know. Or, you know, if you've got some feedback, if, if something that we have said here has helped you, if you feel less alone, anything like that, just let us know how you feel. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, if you love what we're doing, rate us, let us know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Um, if you can go ahead and, and give us a rating on, especially on iTunes so that more people can find us and more people can listen to what we're, we're going on about and you can help us create a community of people that, um, really do love the podcast and, and love the idea of, of everything that we're discussing. That would be great. Uh, again, we have, um, all the socials that we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, you can look up alone in a room with invisible people, or you can look up air whip. It's at air whip, A I A R W I P. You can always email us at Rebecca 
at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com and go ahead and find us and and like holly had mentioned she's got a free course it's a flash fiction course it is available at holly's writing uh, i will put the link on the show notes uh, when we get the show yeah. up i will just include the link so that uh, along with things just some other things uh, that you guys might like exactly we'll make it a little bit easier and put all of this in the show notes too so um well that is uh, that has been today's episode uh inner critic and anything else you want to say holly no, uh, other than thank you for listening, I, you know, for sticking it out with us. By, we ran a little, little over what we were planning on, but uh, I think yeah, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> that, anticipate that that might happen from time to time. Yeah, we, we do tend <laughs> to get a little bit chatty and sometimes we get sidetracked. But again, this is just something that we do anyway. So it's, it's wonderful to have you guys along. And we will see you in the next episode. Have a great time writing. Yes. And now a word from our sponsor. You want to write, you love words, you love fiction, but you don't know where to start or how to middle or where to finish. I do. I'm Holly Lyle and I've been doing this professionally since 1991. And I know how I did what I did to go pro. And I'll be happy to show you what I've learned. Start with my free three-week flash fiction class at hollyswritingclasses.com.